Hello and welcome back to the reading of The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie. We are up to chapter four on the small number of martyrs. Don't you see the beauty of this pleasant weather? There will be no pleasure to come your way if you kill your own self. A Roman official addresses a would-be martyr. In Christian myth, the persecution begin, began with Nero. He, it was said, was the first of the emperors to be declared enemy of the worship of Almighty God. Few people, Christian or otherwise, had expected Nero to be a good thing. His breeding alone augured against it. His father, Domitius, had once, while driving his chariot through a village, run over and killed a young boy for fun. When another nobleman reprimanded him, Domitius turned and gouged out the man's eye. Nero's mother, Agrippina, was little more promising. A society beauty in AD 54, she had murdered her third husband, the Emperor Claudius, by poisoning him with his favourite food of mushrooms at a family dinner. Not even Nero's own father had high hopes for his offspring. When he was born, Domitius remarked sanguinely that any child born to himself and Agrippina was bound to have a detestable nature and become a public danger. Nero did not disappoint. When he first came to power, his misdemeanours were mild. A little too much theatre here, a little brawling there, but things soon deteriorated. Before long, he was seducing freeborn boys and married women. He raped a vestal virgin, married a castrated young boy, and committed incest with his mother. It was said that whenever they rode together in the same litter, they would seize the moment, and the stains on his clothes when he emerged proved it. Like most of Nero's passions, this one didn't last, and Nero soon had Agrippina murdered. Casting round for a new passion, he conceived a novel sexual entertainment. <clears throat> he ordered men and women to be tied to stakes, then had himself released from a den and dressed in wild animal skins, bounded forth and attacked the genitals of his trust captives. Then, as his biographer Suetonius records with fastidiously phrased distaste, though not so fastidious that he didn't record it all, after working up sufficient excitement by these means, he was dispatched shall we say, by his freedman. This, then, or so the scurrilous historians said, was the character of the man who ruled the greatest city on earth, and what a city it was. Around a million people lived on its seven hills, and they walked along a world-famous monuments of awesome beauty and size. Even its infrastructure impressed. Towering aqueducts disgorged millions of gallon, gallons of water a day, filling the city's drinking water basins, its baths, and even a massive fake lake on which mock naval battles could be staged. A million cubic metres of water flowed into the city every day. A thousand litres per head, double the amount available to those living in modern Rome. After Rome fell, no city in Europe would come close to matching its magnificence, and certainly not its plumbing, for well over a millennium. 
This is the picture of the room that we know. However, under the marble exterior lay a far less glossy reality. It is true <clears throat> that the city's sewers were, by the standard of time, remarkable. As one Roman, with true Roman pragmatism, wrote, they were the city's most noteworthy achievement of all. The tunnels were so massive that a man might ride a fully laden wagon along them, but they were far from perfect. Despite the roomy vastness of the cloaca maxima, most people didn't have access to latrines and the streets of Rome provided de facto toilets for much of its population. Sometimes they used chamber pots, at other times they simply relieved themselves in the streets, doorways and behind statues. And while wealthy Romans lived in grand villas, the Emperor Domitian later lived in a palace of 400,000 square metres. Most of the city's population existed in cramped and teetering apartment blocks. These buildings, <clears throat> many as high as seven storeys, were jerry-built, poorly maintained by unscrupulous management agents and prone to falling down. We inhabit a room for the most part supported by thin props, wrote the poet Juvenal bitterly. Housing agents responded to their tenants' problems with minimal efforts. After such an agent had covered a gaping ancient crack, he tells us not to worry as we sleep in a building on the point of collapse. Noise was an incessant problem. As well as thin walls, there was no glass in the windows, and most Romans, at least according to the grumbling of the city's satirists, suffered from chronic insomnia. Any peace was quietly interrupted by the clanging of braziers' hammers or the clattering of carts as they rattled along the flagstones in the darkness. Daytime was a little more serene. Citizens were plagued by everything from the yells of salesmen to the floggings administered by shrill schoolmasters. No peace, and no peace of mind either. For those who rented a home in the rickety apartment blocks, fire was a perpetual fear. Juvenal, eventually fed up with garret life, wrote, If the alarm is raised at the bottom of the stairs, the person protected from the rain by only a little roof tile will be the last to burn. One hot summer's day in AD 64, that fear came true. By nightfall on the 18th of July, a fire had taken hold of some shops near the Circus Maximus. These buildings, fronted with wooden shutters and filled with inflammable goods, provided the conflagration with a wonderful start. Soon houses along the whole length of the circus were ablaze. Before long, the fire had spread to the hills. As the blaze spread overnight, the sound of flames became mingled with the wailing of women and children as they tried to flee, often in vain. The flames, it was said, were so hot and so rapid that those who turned to look behind them found their faces burned by the heat. Rome had a relatively sophisticated fire service, but either the inferno was too fierce to control or something more sinister was going on. It was later said that as it raged, threatening men had appeared, forbidding anyone to extingu extinguish the flames and even hurling firebrands into buildings which hadn't yet caught. Rome burned for almost a week. By the time the fire had finally gone out, three whole quarters of the city had been destroyed and thousands were homeless. Rome was wretched, one man alone, so the historians said, was delighted. As his people fled, 
Nero was said to have spent the entire six days and seven nights of the disaster watching from a high tower, enraptured by the beauty of the flames. He passed the time by getting into costume and singing a composition of his own, The Sack of Ilium, about the burning of another famous city. He probably even played the cithara as he did so, fiddling, as people later anachronistically described it, while Rome burned. Nero looked at the charred ruins of Rome and, instead of seeing disaster, saw or so it was said, the opportunity he had wanted. Building works began almost immediately, not to create homes for the thousands of newly homeless, but for himself. Nero's infamous golden house rose, a palatial and tastelessly glitzy phoenix from the ashes, where flames had once scorched the faces of the fleeing now there was a bathhouse fed by seawater and sulphur water, where once the air had been so hot that buildings spontaneously burst into flame, there now lay a pond the size of a sea, surrounded by buildings made to look like miniature cities. Even by Nero's standards, this place was extravagant. The whole house glittered, so they said, like fire with overlaid gold, in which glowed jewels and mother of pearl. The roof of the dining room was fitted with ivory panels that could turn to release showers of petals upon the diners below, while pipes sprinkled a fine rain of perfume, wild animals roamed through the landscape gardens. It was a rural idyll inside one of the largest cities on earth. When the palace was completed, Nero was finally content. Good, he said. Now I can at last begin to live like a human being. Listen carefully, however, and over the sounds of splashing water and the roar of those wild beasts, you might have heard another noise, the murmurs of a deeply discontented populace. The citizens of Rome were angry, and they were suspicious. Nero, they whispered, had started the fire intentionally to clear the space for the palace that gleamed where the flames had glowed. Nero himself, perhaps aware of the bitterness, blamed a different group. A new cult had recently arrived in Rome. The historian Tacitus later described it as a pernicious superstition. The followers of this superstition were said to be the troublesome adherents of a man named Christus, or possibly according to the historian Suetonius, Crestus. They were Tacitus added, a group popularly called Christians, and they were hated for their perversions. Tacitus added a little more. The name's source was one Christus, he wrote, executed by the governor Pontius Pilate when Tiberius held power. A significant sentence. This was the sole mention of this event in a non-Christian source from this period. Tacitus was a little more enthusiastic about the Christians, adding the typically misanthropic Tacitian conclusion that after Jesus's execution, the pernicious creed suppressed at the time was bursting forth again, not only in Judea, where this evil originated, but even in Rome, into which from all directions everything appalling and shameful flows and foregathers. By the time of the Great Fire in AD 64, 
it seems that there were some Christians living in the capital. Certainly there were enough that when Nero was looking for scapegoats for the Inferno, they not only seemed a plausible target, but he was able to find a number of them to accuse. And to accuse, for Nero, was to convict, and to convict was to punish. The actual crime was not arson, oddly, but hatred of humankind. The Christians were sentenced to death. The mode of their execution showed, even by Nero's standards, a lunatic creativity. Some were dressed in animal skins and then torn to pieces by wild dogs. Others, convicted of making fire, died by it. As dusk fell in Nero's garden, Christians were nailed to crosses, then burned, serving as unusual nighttime illuminations. Nero threw open his gardens for the spectacle as a treat, or perhaps a warning to others. As the killings were taking place, he wandered among his guests while dressed, for no clear reason other than perhaps he liked chariot racing, as a charioteer. The display was so gruesome that even the Romans, not a people known to shirk the spectacle of painful death, were disconcerted. A feeling of pity started to grow among them since the Christians' annihilation seemed to arise not from public utility but from one man's brutality. brutality. This, then, was where it began, the first imperial persecution of the Christians. According to Christian historians, it was very far from the last. Christian literature would go on to portray Roman emperors and their officials as demonically possessed servants of Satan who hungered insatiably for Christian blood. It is a very potent picture, but it is not true. Martyrs have always made good drama. When William Caxton introduced his printing press to London in the 15th century, one of the books he chose to print was the compilation of saints' lives, or more precisely, their deaths, known as the Golden Legend. This collection by Jacobus de Varenne, dating from around 1260, had already been a huge hit on the continent. Caxton, a talented translator as well as a shrewd businessman, knew an opportunity when he saw one. He promptly translated these verses into vividly salty prose. The description of the death of St Alban provides a taste of the whole. St Alban's torturer, this tale explains, opened his navel, took out one end of his bowels and fastened it to a stake which he piped into the ground and made the holy man to go round about the stake and drove him with whips and beat him till that his bowels were wounden out of his body. Caxton chose well. This book was a huge success, running to nine editions, a medieval bestseller. The persecutions of Christians under the Romans had been a terrible time, but in the memory of the later church it also became glorified as a wonderful one. According to the popular narrative, still widely believed to this day, all across the Roman Empire, Christians eagerly stepped forward to confess the risen Lord, whatever the cost. Stories hymned the thousands upon thousands of Christians who had died willingly, even joyfully, for their faith. No sooner had the first batch been sentenced, wrote the historian Eusebius, then others from every side would jump on the platform in front of the judge and proclaim themselves Christians. They paid no heed to torture. Indeed, far from putting off potential converts, 
the Christians liked to say that the sight of their fellows being tortured to death merely tempted others to join up. This, Christian writers claimed, was a useful recruitment tool. The apologist, Tertullian, summed it up with his usual brio. We become more numerous every time we are hewn down by you, he said. The blood of the Christians is seed. Another author saw the dead as playing a slightly different role in the Garden of Belief, explaining that the blood of martyrs watered the churches. The martyrdoms also filled the inkwells of the later church and martyr stories proliferated. These images exerted a powerful hold over European art for centuries. In the 4th century, poetic epics were written about the martyrs by the poet Prudentius, who lingered lovingly over details of torn flesh, consuming flames and exposed and still throbbing organs. So influential were such tales that the academic Robin Lane Fox has pointed out when a group of Christians were martyred by the Muslim authorities in Cordoba in the 9th century, the accounts of their trials set them before a consul, as if this was all taking place in ancient Rome. Walk around any great European art gallery today and the walls will be peopled with the most agonising deaths depicted in lovingly and often alarmingly graphic detail. Martyrs became art, and not always good art, while the earliest and most reliable martyr tales were often affecting in their simplicity and their honesty. Many of the later and more fictional ones suffered from crass characterisation, barely sublimated sexuality and lashings of gore. The Victorians naturally adored them. In the 19th century, hymns flowed from pious pens. Bright the stones which bruise thee gleam, ran one verse on St Stephen, who had been stoned to death. Sprinkled with thy life's blood stream, another hymned the saints who met the tyrant's brandished steel, the lion's gory mane. Four centuries after Caxton, these lurid stories could still shift copies. In 1895, the Polish writer Henryk Sienkiewicz published a novel that became an international bestseller and contributed to his being awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. This 73 chapter behemoth told the story of the Christian martyrs who were put to death by the Emperor Nero. It concluded with the observation that Nero passed on as a whirlwind, as a storm, as a fire, as war or death passes, but the Basilica of Peter still stands on the Vatican Hill and rules over the city and the world. Today the book has been all but forgotten, but its title, Quo Vedis, has not. Hollywood went on to make numerous film and television series by this name. The most famous, the 1951 Sword and Sandals epic, in which a rotund Peter Ustinov as Nero smirkingly looks on while Christians wearing white and looking pious are pursued by lions in the arena managing to sing, hy sing hymns up to the very moment of mauling. But, although martyr stories have often made for arresting and compelling drama, very few, if any, of these tales are based on historical fact. These were simply not that many years. There were simply not that many years of imperially ordered persecution in the Roman Empire. Fewer than 13 in three whole centuries of Roman rule. 
These years may have loomed understandably large in Christian accounts, but to allow them to dominate the narrative in the way that they have and still do is at best misleading and at worst a gross misrepresentation. During these first centuries of the new religion, local persecutions of Christians occurred, but we know of no government-led persecution for the first 250 years of Christianity with the exception of Nero's. And Nero, with even-handed lunacy, persecuted everyone. For two and a half centuries, the Roman imperial government left Christianity alone. The idea, therefore, of a line of satanically inspired emperors panting for the blood of the faithful is another Christian myth. As the modern historian Keith Hopkins wrote, the traditional questions, why were the per Christians persecuted, with all its implications of unjust repression and eventual triumph, should be rephrased, why were the Christians persecuted so little and so late? Nevertheless, martyr tales have been hugely influential not least on Christianity's image of itself, the academic Candida Moss has argued that in the years that followed the persecutions, Christianity came to see itself with great pride as a persecuted church. Its greatest heroes were not those who did good deeds, but those who died in the most painful ways. <clears throat> If you are willing to die an excruciating end in the arena, then whatever your previous holiness or lack thereof, you went straight to heaven, martyrdom wiped out all sins on the point of death, as well as getting there faster. Martyrs enjoyed preferential terms in paradise, getting to wear the much desired martyr's crown. Tempting celestial terms were offered it was said that the scripture promised multiplication even to a hundred times of brothers, children, parents, land and homes. Precisely how this celestial sum had been calculated is not clear. But the general principle was those who died early, publicly and painfully would be the best rewarded. In many of the martyr tales, the driving force is less that the Romans want to kill and more that the Christians wanted to die. Why wouldn't they? Paradoxically, martyrdom held considerable benefits for those willing to take it on. One was its egalitarian entry qualifications. As George Bernard Shaw acidly observed over a millennium later, Martyrdom is the only way a man can become famous without ability. More than that, in a socially and sexually unequal era, it was a way in which women and even slaves might shine. Unlike most positions of power in the highly socially stratified late Roman Empire, this was a glory that was open to all, regardless of rank, education, wealth or sex. The sociologist Rodney Stark had pointed out that, provided you believe in its promised rewards, martyrdom is a perfectly rational choice. A martyr could begin the day of their death as one of the lowliest people in the empire and end it as one of the most exalted in heaven. So tempting were the rewards that pious Christians born outside times of persecution were wont to express disappointment at being denied the opportunity of an agonising death. When the later Emperor Julian pointedly avoided executing Christians in his reign, one Christian writer, far from being grateful, sourly recorded that Julian had begrudged the honour of martyrdom to our combatants. These were incitements for Christians not only to die, but to die as painful a death as possible. As one soon to be martyred, Christian irritably explained, the greater the pain, the greater the gain. 
Those whose victory is slower and with greater difficulty, these receive the more glorious crown. As martyr literature developed, the descriptions of the deaths became graphic to the point of prurient. In one gruesome account by Prudentius, a judge orders a Christian to be put on the rack till the joints of his bones in every limb are rent asunder with a crack. Then with cleaving strokes, lay bare his ribs of their covering so that his organs shall be exposed as they throb in the recesses of the wounds. The early martyrdom accounts are far stranger than is often remembered. Several verge on the salacious. Breasts, slim, naked or dripping with milk are a theme. In later tales, female martyrs are frequently required to strip naked, whereupon the crowd will be struck by their beauty. Toothsome beauties are often dispatched by lecherous governors to the brothel before death. In the apocryphal, but once popular, Acts of Paul and Thessala, Repeated pains to virginity sit uncomfortably alongside passages that border on the titillating. Thesla is a great beauty who is determined to remain a virgin, and of course she is more than once required to strip off in front of a crowd. One night she goes to visit Paul in prison, and her faith also was increased as she kisses kissed his chains. A phrase to keep students of gender studies busy for decades. In martyr poems, mothers watch the martyrdom of their children with eager relish. In one story, a mother rejoices that she has born a son who will die a martyr and embracing his body congratulates herself on her offspring. In another, the sight of a young boy being whipped is so atrocious that the eyes of all those present at the execution, even those of the Roman court stenographers, grow wet with tears. The boy's mother, by contrast, showed none of this sorrowing. Her brow alone was bright and clear with joy. The mother willingly carries her son in her arms to the executioner. As the boy's little head is severed from his neck, she catches it and presses it joyfully to her fond breast. Or did she? How many of these famous and emotive tales actually happened? As the early, early Christian author Origen admitted, the number of martyrs were few enough to be easily countable and Christians had died for their faith only occasionally. The stories might have proliferated, but as the church realised when it started to analyse them properly, many were little more than stories. In the 17th century, one scholar wrote a radical paper entitled Depositate, Depositate Martyrium on the small number of martyrs that just made this point. For all the hyperbole, as Edward Gibbon crushingly put it, the average annual consumption of martyrs in Rome during the persecutions was no more than 150 per year during years of persecution. And there were few of those years. What state-sanctioned attacks there were fell into three main phases the Dacian, the Valerian, seven years later, and the Great Persecution, 50 odd years after that in AD 303. Not all of these persecutions were intended to explicitly target Christians. The Dacian persecution began in AD 250, when Decius issued an edict requiring everyone in the empire to sacrifice to him. True Christians should refuse to sacrifice to anything. A re request to sacrifice to the emperor or gods became a common courtroom test of someone's Christianity. 
and these later formed the climax of many a martyr tale. The intent of Decius's edict was to ensure loyalty from his empire. But as Christians were not supposed to sacrifice to such a demon, some refused. But though Decius's edict caught Christians, it almost certainly had not been aimed at them. And it was brief. Little more than a year after the first persecution had been launched, it had finished. Valerian's persecution continued for approximately three years and resulted in a few deaths. Valerian himself was then taken captive in Persia by the Persian king Shapur I. It is true that the more substantial great persecution that followed was responsible for around half of all early Christian martyrdoms, but it petered out quickly in the West and officially ended after a decade. While it was going on, it was terrible. Scriptures were burned, Christians were tortured and executed and churches were destroyed, but it was limited. There were intermittent local persecutions too, but these were sporadic and had an inconsequential effect on the spread of religion. The Romans did not seek to wipe Christianity out. If they had, they would almost certainly have succeeded. Ever since the paper on the small number of martyrs, the death toll cited for the Roman persecutions has been dropping steadily. Detailed analysis of the calendar of saints revealed a picture that some has been described as more romantic fiction than historical fact. Some saints appeared multiple times, other saints' names had clearly been at best misrecorded, mixed with the names of the consuls for that year. Several saints appeared never to have existed at all. It is now thought that fewer than 10 martyrdom tales from the early church can be considered reliable. The martyr stories, inspiring and entertaining though they may be, show what the scholar G. E. M. de Saint Croix called an increasing contempt for historicity. To understand what really happened between the Christians and the Romans, you must begin instead not with the martyr tales but with one of the most accurate historical accounts we have. You must begin with the very first mention of Christians by a non-Christian writer. <laughs>